Hello, I'm Caroline McGuire, and um, I am a social skills coach, ADHD coach, and the author of Why Will No One Play With Me. Um, this is one of my all-time favorite topics, since I think it's really, really important that we learn how to talk to our kids of all ages so that we can move forward and solve all kinds of problems. I just had a friend in my office, a, a client, who this is one of the main issues, so it couldn't be more perfect. No matter what your dilemma, whether it's homework, whether it's um, homeschooling, whether it's um, kids who don't want to go to karate, even though they said for you to sign them up, if it's teenagers who want to do things and maybe some of them are high risk behaviors or they want to do nothing or they don't talk to you and they disappear into the basement, in all instances, we have to be able to talk and communicate with our kids. And one of the things that I um, have used over the years is this method that I'm going to teach you tonight um, that is really what coaches do, and it works really well. And it works with even kids who do not like to talk. And that's one of the big questions I always get. Um, some kids will talk your ear off. Other kids, even if you use certain techniques, they won't talk. So the things I'm going to teach you tonight really work with anyone. Um, and that is the key important thing. And I always joke they work with mother-in-laws. They work with bosses. You can use them with anyone. I'm going to just start with something that you probably will recognize right away, which is that every kid has a story. Every child has a story, and those stories are part of what is keeping this communication at bay. Um, they have beliefs around all different things, and those beliefs or stories that they tell themselves are what part of what gets in the way of your communication. Because if you think about it, if you've ever been being talked at by someone and you think they're wrong or you think there's no point in this conversation, there's not a problem, then you don't really take in the information as well. So part of the technique I'm going to teach you tonight, you want to use it for this story. So if this rings true to you, you might need to spend a bunch of time on this. Okay, one of the stories, smart kids don't have friends. The other one is, I make reasonable arguments. A kid told me this today, and that we should bargain. In other words, you know, we all as parents should listen and we should bargain. There should be a trade um, instead of really trying to collaboratively problem solve. The other thing is kids will say to me, I will do better as an adult. So the fact that I have 49 missing homework assignments doesn't matter. When I'm an adult, I will do better. This is very magical thinking, right? Why will you do better? What will change? But if a kid has that story and they are entrenched in that, when you're talking, they're not necessarily lifting, listening. So part of what we're trying to do is get our kids to listen, which means we have to sometimes accept where they are and try to help them build awareness. Because of weak executive function, the management system of the brain, and other ADHD challenges, kids with ADHD, teenagers, young adults, all of the above, even some of us adults, tend to have these stories, and we tend to have sort of a skewed lens on things, and that's part of what interrupts communication. Here's another favorite. I'm not a school person right? So I'm not a school person. That's why this doesn't go well. I'll do well in the real world. By the way, that was 100% my story when I was young, and it's just not true. Part of what I want to talk to you tonight is this idea of paving the way toward these conversations. So there's a few things. We as parents tend to get frustrated. We jump right in. We tell, 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 and we don't tend to let our kids actually have a say. The other thing is that if you have a strained relationship with your child and there are stressors, which after a year of COVID, after many things could totally be possible for many of us, my suggestion is that you spend some time building the relationship and that we as adults listen to their perspective. Listening to their perspective is really hard sometimes. 
building their relationship and sort of letting things go or figuring out when are the best times to have these conversations can be a process that takes a long time, but it's time well spent. Because if I want my kid to talk about stuff the minute they walk in the door, but they're the kind of kid who only will do it when they're fishing or when they're occupied or when we're in the car and they don't have to look at me, we have to shift the way we're doing things in order to get Get them to listen. I'm sorry, it's 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 awful. As parents, we always have to make the adjustments. The other thing is, if there are elephants in the room, things like homework, topics that have been beaten to death, spend time with your child of any age, having fun, doing things they care about, and not talking about those topics. Because the more we hammer on those topics, the less they want to talk about them. So the actual like inverse of what we want is, is there. If we let it go for a while, now we're able to actually talk about it in a different way. That's what I call paving. We're paving the way toward a conversation. The way that we can get our kids more open is by being a little more detached. So um, I have just, I am gonna show you guys how to reach this at the end, but I have just made a series of videos with um, kids from all over the world of all ages um, uh, using the methods. And, and one of the things you'll notice in all the videos is that because I'm not their mom, right? I'm detached. I use these methods with my own kids. There are videos on my website, carolinemaguireauthor.com, and I'll put that up in the chat in a minute, um, where I show you how I um, use this method. One of the kids in the videos is my daughter. The reason I'm stressing some detachment is that when we tell, we tend to push our agenda and we're not really being as collaborative. So. Two methods you can use to get your kid to open up, to have more collaborative conversations, and to gain key information. One is, is open questions. Open questions are a way of asking things, who, where, how, those kind of questions, right? So instead of saying, you never leave your comfort zone, you really seem to think that you never have to be uncomfortable. In life, you have to be uncomfortable. You need grit. You have to try hard things. You're holding yourself back, right? That's the kind of stuff we say because we get frustrated. I would advise using open questions. So what does it feel like when you're doing something you love? What does it feel like when you're doing something hard? How is it different? What makes something good to do? What makes it hard to do, right? When do you feel like you're in your comfort zone? What happens when you're outside your comfort zone? The idea here that you'll see in these videos that I've made really is about getting information. So when we ask an open question, we have to be open to the information we're getting, but you get more information because we're not pushing an agenda. We're trying to get to the root. Um, I will say this, over the years that I've been working as a coach, many parents tell me they know exactly why something happens. But most of the time, and this actually happened um, again today as I was working, most of the time we actually don't know. So the open questions provide something amazing that we need as parents, especially parents of teenagers. They provide intel. The more information we have, the more we can have these conversations. So by asking questions like, you know, what feels heavy to you? What feels light? What feels good to you? What feels boring? You're gonna get information that you probably didn't know. So instead of saying that you don't like a friend, you don't think they're good, you don't think you treat them well, talk more generally about friendship. What does it look like? What does it look like to have someone treat you well? Those kind of questions open kids up you get key information and you get that information that you need to actually get your kid to listen. When they feel heard and they get to make their argument, then you can go into a more problem solving mode. The other technique that I really can't stress enough because it is so, so good is reflective listening here. 
Reflective listening is literally used in prisons because it is something that helps people decompress, feel heard, and it sort of actually allows the situation to be less heightened and less intense. And it's simple. You can use it with anyone. You can start using it tonight. All you do is repeat back your child's statements without giving an opinion. You can use their exact words or you can just recap. I don't always remember people's exact words, so sometimes I just recap. But either way, it's amazing what you get. So if you are you're then confirming what your child says, you're clarifying. Maybe you didn't understand. Maybe the issue with karate isn't that it's boring. It's its time of day, right? So if you reflect back and say, okay, what I hear you saying is you would go to karate, but you don't want to go so late at night because then you have to shift off homework right? Now, if your child thinks you're wrong, you can, they can say, no, 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 it's not that. Now you get key information and you're really getting to the root of things. You're clarifying. The other thing is that try reflecting in your life. People feel very validated. If you recap what someone says, instead of feeling like you're disconnected from them or you're not listening or you're just waiting to jump in with your comment, they really feel validated. And because they really feel validated, they're able to listen to you more. The more validated, especially teenagers, because remember the developmental stage of teenagers is that they are supposed to want to break away from us as parents. They're supposed to want to assert their independence. The problem is with kids with ADHD, they are three to five years behind in many cases in terms of maturity. So they want to break away from us, but they may not have the skills or they may have an opinion that they should give everything up, but you know that it might not be the best thing for them. So the best tack forward is a more collaborative approach where we're both listening to each other and we're finding compromise and we're collaborating together. The way to start toward this can be reflective listening. You aren't expressing an opinion, you're literally just reflecting it back. And the beautiful thing that happens is that kids also hear their own statement. So I don't know if you've ever had this experience, but if you haven't, try reflecting tonight. When you hear someone say your words, it's almost like you float above your body and you hear your op the opinion and what you've said. And sometimes when you hear it, it, you're like, oh, that doesn't sound so good, right? So I had a kid today who told me that everything has to be a compromise, everything has to be give and take, and he really could not just allow another person to, um, you know, he wouldn't play their game. He wouldn't necessarily compromise. And that's what's been happening with his parents. And I reflected that to him. Okay, so you really feel like everything should be give or take. You're not meeting people halfway. You're, you're just, you're, you're going to do tit for tat. You're going to do give and take. I reflected what he said. And when he heard it, it didn't sound that good, does it? And so he said, well, I guess that doesn't sound good. That sounds like I'm, I'm inflexible. So do you see what I did? I didn't tell him he was inflexible. I let him hear that inflexibility. And I used exercises and I used language. So he was looking at himself. I'm holding a mirror up to himself. By holding a mirror up to someone using reflective listening, they're getting to witness the world. They're getting to witness the social world, the academic world. We're allowing them to hear things rather than be told. One of the beautiful things about this technique is that it builds a key executive function. Metacognition is a key executive function that everyone needs. Let me tell you what it does, and you can, you can see if this really will help. Executive function is the management system of the brain, and it is responsible for things like organization, planning, future thinking. Sound like things your teenager needs? Yes. So a bird's eye view or metacognition is to have an accurate assessment of your skills and abilities, understand whether or not you put effort into a task, be aware of what you do well and what your strengths and weaknesses are, and then 
use past experiences and your knowledge of those themes and what's gone on to inform your future plan, right? It's an absolutely essential skill that we use in every walk of our lives. What happens with kids with ADHD is due to weak executive function, this is not necessarily a skill they have. But rather than telling them that, we can use our open questions, right? So if you think your kid is not taking a bird's eye view of a situation, if you're aware that your teenager wants certain rights and privileges but isn't demonstrating things, using questions and reflection, you can walk them through taking a bird's eye view, right? Okay, what do we know about projects and what do we know about past themes and what's gone on? Even if they deny the truth of what went on, you can ask questions and reflect and ask them, well, it did get in, but what led up to that, right? Now they're taking a bird's eye view of the situation. They're building that metacognitive muscle and you're not the enemy. And this is a life skill. They need this for life. You're not going, I always joke to the kids I work with, I'm not going to college with them. I'm not going to live with them for the rest of their lives. I want to teach them to fish. Now, here's another thing. If we want to get our kids to listen, then one of the best things we can do is build conversations with them. This is called build on that. It's where you literally build Jenga cubes and you have conversations. The more we have conversations around topics, the more our kids will learn to build those key conversation skills that are absolutely essential in life. So having dinner time and family conversation, not where you, you know, talk about these hard topics can really be something that builds these skills and also builds their relationship with you. The other thing is I'm working with a group called um, Choose Love. It's a nonprofit started by a mother whose child died um, at Sandy Hook, and she provides free social emotional education for schools, which costs normally hundreds of thousands of dollars. And so she started this foundation. And so I'm working with her and I'm doing a fundraiser with her. I get nothing out of it. And we've made videos with real kids from all over the world um, and all different ages. And one of the lessons that you would get as part of this subscription, I wanted to show you tonight, but the technology wouldn't quite work because um, the video guy didn't get it to me in time, but it's called the comfort zone. And the video is of me doing this technique that I just described to you with a young, uh, like a tween who isn't a big talker. So a lot of the kids that I've chosen, I've chosen because they're not like thrilled to be with me. And I think that's very real. Um, I didn't want to choose kids who are super verbose because that's not real. Um, so if you go to how to sell, and I can put this in the chat, um, or go to my website, you can actually um, get these videos and it's very, very cheap. It's very affordable. Um, and I get nothing out of it. It's for Choose Love. But the videos are great. They're turning out great. And they're really about about showing you how to do this with kids. Um, I also have a free handout for you um, about teaching social skills in daily life. Since we are in a complete crisis right now as a result of COVID, I'm in Massachusetts. All kids have gone back to in-person school. Skills are rusty and kids are really having big reactions to things. So communicating is absolutely key. All right, I will turn it over to questions. I'm happy to answer anything. Um, can you speak to the autonomy that kids with ADHD want, but they often fail when you grant them the autonomy? How do you strike a balance? Um, they want independence, they want to be given privileges, but they actually, I don't want to say can't be given privileges, but they are not necessarily successful um, at it. So here's the first thing I would say. Um, I would have open conversations about what your expectations are and what you need to see for them to have autonomy. Don't say things like be more responsible sit down and really lay it out. If you haven't watched the work of Dr. Ross Green on collaborative problem solving, a lot of what I'm speaking to 
is built on that work. Um, we're trying to problem solve, so we want to share with them, I need to see X, Y, and Z before I can allow you to, you know, take the car across state lines. Um, and I would say that with executive functions, there's longitudinal evidence that executive functions can be built. So with developmental delays, which I hate this word, but that is what ADHD results in, we want to make sure we're raising their skill levels and bringing them forward. So we do want to give them things that they do that build that maturity muscle. And we want to reflect and use those kind of techniques to highlight mistakes, wins, and look at the incident. Part of why coaching works so well here is that it's a very reflective, self-reflective process. So if you are successful or not, we're looking at those things and we're learning from them. Part of why we can't give our kids as much independence at times is they don't seem to learn from their mistakes. If you reflect on them with your kid, not saying, gee, you made this mistake, it was so bad, but if you develop a pattern of looking at things and talking about them and not beating them up, they will learn from them more because they're self-reflecting which is one of the most important things all of us know in life. Uh, the question is, how does this work with five-year-olds? Oh, well, great question. I had one who just turned six, um, who I was working with. And one of the things that um, is interesting is little kids can answer questions. They, they really can. Um, you just have to make the question a little simpler, right? So um, the quote of the day that I loved was um, where I asked a little kid a question and he said, I just want it the way I want it, Caroline. I like it the way I like it. And he showed his own inflexibility, but he didn't know. <laughs> He didn't know enough to know, like, you're really showing your hand here. Um, I definitely use these techniques. And I also think reflecting works so well. I do a lot of coaching with little ones as well as teenagers. I kind of have the two ends of the spectrum. And um, it really can work. You just have to be simple. What's hard about that? What do you like? Um, why are rules? What makes rules important? You know, you you act those kind of questions. And if they don't understand, just twist it a little bit. But the reflecting makes it, it is, is, is really powerful um, and can really work with them. And they may not react like a teenager would where the light bulb goes off, but you're, you're making them feel heard. And you can say things like, let's problem solve together. Uh, the next question is, um, what is the best time management tool that you have found for junior high kids or middle schoolers? So um, she was a keynote a few years ago, Sarah Ward, um, W-A-R-D, um, is an executive function coach, and she has an excellent planner. She has excellent time management tools. Now he's, here's the cute, cool, the, the thing that I would say that Sarah would probably agree with because she has kids like us. Um, you have to get the kid to use it. And that's the hardest part is the motivation to use it. And sometimes it involves what's in it for me, right? What do I get out of trying these techniques? And sometimes it involves what is interesting to me and I'm motivated toward. Um, but they are excellent. Um, and they really work well in terms of also building that future thinking muscle, which we really need to build. Um, the next question is, how can I find an executive function, function coach or program in my area? Um, okay, so um, if you go to um, my website, carolinemaguireauthor.com, um, there are some coaches listed who do social and who I've trained. I've trained about 150 people in my methodology, which is um, the only one accredited by the International Coach Federation. Um, if you go to ADD Coach Academy, um, all those people are on there, not just the few that I've listed who do a ton of social skills work. So ADD Coach Academy has a list, and if they work with families and kids, it has a specific designation that's, that's listed right there. 
the next question is, is your advice applicable to children who have autism with low support needs in addition to ADHD? Would any of the advice not apply to kids who also have autism? Yes. So I work with a lot of kids on the autism spectrum, formerly known as Asperger's syndrome, those those kind of autistic kids, level one autism. Um, and there's a couple things. Kids with autism cannot answer open questions. It has to be more situationally based. Um, so I would not use the open questions with them, but I would use situational questions, which you probably are already doing. And I would use the reflection. The reflection works really well with them. I love my Spectrum kids and a lot of what I do, I sort of have, um, you know, tried out with them, but not the open questions. So open questions, um, they can't answer, but they can definitely use the reflection and, and there definitely can be that um, shifting the mindset element that we use, which, you know, to, to bring in that social thinking and to bring in the awareness of other people, um, we can do a lot with step into their shoes and a lot with helping kids um, understand that not everybody has the same perspective. Um, this is a really good question. Um, when do you know when kids need a coach? I think whenever, if you have the resources, right, and you can get your child help, and you know that their ADHD challenges are such that they cannot um, function without you, right, and they're not um, able to do the same thing as their same age peers, I, I would work to, to get them a coach if you have the resources. Um, in you know, it, look, it's harder to coach your own kid, but you can. I know not everybody says that, but you're their original teacher. You can work with them and millions of parents do. And the reason homeschooling has been a nightmare isn't just we're working with our own kids, it's that we're working without a playbook. So if you need to work with your kid, which you do for reinforcement, to bridge from school, to bridge from groups to home, um, you can do these things. You're just going to have to read the playbook and you're going to have to learn. Um, two kids with ADHD and a contentious relationship. Advice for practicing reflective listening during arguments. Um, I think the biggest advice I have is that if you try to have a neutral tone and you just say, okay, I'm hearing that you feel like this is unfair and you should have these privileges because you are 15, right? That you're going to stay neutral. And one of the big things that Dr. Ross Green talks about that I, I'm just such a fan of is trying to shift things to this collaborative problem solving model and trying to say, okay, so then the next step is like, here's the dilemma, right? There have been times in the past where things happen. I'd love to work with you, but I need to find compromise so that you're safe. Because my problem is you need to be safe. Right. So now you just stated the dilemma in a really neutral way. You weren't a historian. Don't go into everything that ever happened, you know, since they were two. Right. That's my biggest advice. If like tonight I was saying to a kid, parents don't give up on certain things. So here's the dilemma. Like you want X. Right. Let's take a bird's eye view. Are your parents going to, you know let you not graduate from high school. No, right? So we have to find compromise. And that way, they see you meeting them halfway. The other advice I have is listen to what they say. You may want to ask them, I don't want to have this relationship with you. What can I do differently? Now, some kids are going to say, you cannot exist. You can let everything go, blah, blah, blah try to get them in the mindset or where there's a particular moment where you can listen and they can say something reasonable. Many, many of the kids that I work with where that's the case, when I ask them, they tell me, you know, the minute I get off the bus, 
My parents are there with the list of the missing homework assignments. They jump right on me. I haven't even walked through the front door. And so we make bargains. The parents will no longer do that. We're gonna have to talk about it. And here's how when we make a compromise. That way you're giving a little, because one of the things that teenagers particularly hate is they feel like we as adults don't ever compromise, which isn't true, but that's their perception. So that's my biggest advice too. Neutrality, don't be a historian. And then to, to hear what maybe you could change and how you approach things. Uh, should my 13 year old be disciplined for not following instructions or finishing chores, et cetera? Um, you know, the thing about disciplining is that it doesn't necessarily change things as many of you probably have seen, right? So you can take stuff away, but it doesn't necessarily change things. I don't want to let everything go either. What I would suggest is trying to figure out what's hard about chores, what's boring about chores. Remember, boredom can cause literal physical symptoms in us because ADHD is about a lack of ignition in the brain, under aroused, interest is our fuel. So if your child finds chores boring, which many of us do, we have to learn to do these things, but there might be some compromise, right? If you live with roommates, sometimes I do the trash and you do the dishes, right? So I would talk about what's hard, what gets in the way. I would talk about your need for help and collaboration. Make yourself, you're a human being, right? You need help. You can't always put out the trash. You're working. You need this. You need that. And then what, what could be a little compromise, right? Could it be that the sister puts out the trash and they do the dishes, which they find less boring. The other thing is um, sometimes we have to learn to play games with ourselves. And that's a big way that we get things done, right? So what games can this child play with themselves so that they think about like, I'm gonna get these done in 15 minutes and then afterwards I get this reward or I get to you know see how fast I can get it done. Um, that's a huge way we get things done is to sort of self incentivize. So you may want to work on that. Um, I think that again goes back to this problem solving. Um, you can discipline, but it sometimes does not change anything. And there are kids who will literally have everything taken away and still not do it. Um, and so I don't want to say like that's the answer because it doesn't always work. Okay, everybody, this concludes the webinar for this evening. I wanted to thank Caroline for this wonderful presentation and for all of the information that she has provided. So um, thank you everybody for joining us and I hope you will join us for the next webinar. Um, have a good night.